Today, the first supply ships enter the Antarctic ice. 2,200 miles from New Zealand, the nearest civilization, and 11,000 miles from home. These ships were with us last year and the year before. Old timers all to this Antarctic mission. Each year they return to the roost in McMurdo Sound to resupply our remote scientific stations. Fuel oil makes up a large portion of the cargo brought by the ships. We've been shipping increasing quantities of oil to McMurdo each year. Fuel for all our Antarctic stations. Fuel for tractors and trucks and generators. Fuel for heating and for cooking fires. Now, for the first time, change in this logistic pattern. Today, the Arneb unloads a 1,500 kilowatt nuclear power plant, the PM3A. This portable medium power plant introduces reactor power to the continent. It was developed and manufactured by the Martin Company's nuclear division, under contract to the United States Atomic Energy Commission for use by the Navy. It is an important link in the chain of Antarctic events, an integral part of the United States program for the development of Antarctica. Of course, anything you do in the Antarctic, including PM3A, must reckon with the intense cold and remoteness of the continent. Here, the temperature drops to minus 60, and the night is four months long. Main base for this program is McMurdo Station on Ross Island, which is separated from the mainland by McMurdo Sound. The sound is frozen over during most of the year, and the ice forms Williams Field, the aerial port of entry for most of Antarctica. Even the Soviets on their way to their inland bases sometimes pass through Williams. McMurdo Station has its back to Observation Hill, where we will erect the nuclear power plant. The McMurdo area was first occupied by explorer Sir Robert Scott in 1910. This was his base camp, from which he mounted the assault on the pole that ended with his death. The present base was constructed between December 1955 and March 1956. It is the Antarctic headquarters for USARP, United States Antarctic Research Project, a joint effort of the United States Navy and the National Science Foundation. It is also field headquarters for Naval Support Forces Antarctica. The Navy performs the administrative and logistic functions on the continent. The National Science Foundation sponsors the work of some 200 scientists. What they learn in their studies of marine biology, about the way of life led beneath the ice shelves, may shed light on man's adaptability to outer space, or provide a new supply of food for future generations. Other scientists are studying weather conditions. There is no other place on Earth so cold or dry in the presence of so much water. Our plant will furnish electric power for these men. But to have it ready for them by the winter of 1963, we had to meet a rigid schedule. The package system having passed its tests and ready for duty, was loaded aboard the USS Arneb, CB Center, Davisville, Rhode Island. The system is packaged into modules no larger than 30 feet long by 8 feet 8 inches square. The maximum weight of each module is 30,000 pounds. The Arneb carries not only the plant itself, but its fuel, two core loadings, 
fuel enough to last four years. The Arnett left the United States on November 3rd, less than 15 months after contract go-ahead. As winter approaches in the northern hemisphere, the Arneb starts its journey to Antarctic summer. She steams south covering 11,000 miles in five weeks. Simultaneously, the Navy operating crew, AEC representatives, and Martin engineers were airlifted to McMurdo. They joined the Seabees, who were already at work completing the... The site had been selected and prepared a year earlier. It waited through the winter of 1961 for summer and the arrival of the Seabees. The Arneb was secured to the ice shelf at McMurdo Sound on December 13, 1961, and unloaded. The time available for unloading from the ship, for installation, and for initial checkout is limited to two and a half months. The packages were moved on sleds from the ship, across the ice, and up Observation Hill to the PM3A site. The Seabees will work two 11-hour shifts to finish the job before the sun signals the onset of winter by dipping below the horizon. These vessels contain the reactor and the steam generator. These tanks provide auxiliary functions, spent fuel storage, radioactive waste concentration and storage, and increase of containment volume. Rock is crushed to make an earth shield around the tanks. Packed around the tanks, it forms an effective barrier to radiation. As work goes on, snow, another reminder that winter is never far off. Work must not stop, and inside, away from the weather, conditions are better. The turbine generator is installed in the center of the building. The switchgear distributes the power output of the generator through the nearby substation to the McMurdo base. Outside, we're installing the condensers, which receive the exhaust steam from the turbine. They are direct air to steam type, and they need no liquid coolant. Water flows out of them into the hot well. It is deaerated and heated by the heat transfer equipment and returned to the steam generator for another cycle. The plant contains its own complete laboratory for analysis of system water, and a control area for the decontamination of equipment and personnel. The months of December and January pass as the plant nears completion. Piping, wiring, alignment of equipment, and installation of firefighting gear occupy the last days of construction. The crew can begin the pre-critical testing of the plant. The plant is operated by a three-man team per shift. From the console, one operator monitors and controls all of the nuclear, steam, and electrical systems. Turboprop engines and a specially configured ski landing gear permit for the first time giant loads of up to 10 tons to be ski landed on the natural snow surface of the polar plateau.
At the same time that the C-130 Hercules delivers bulk loads to the inland stations and camps, additional supplies are airdropped by the Air Force's C-124 Globemaster. Before the advent of the Navy's Hercules, virtually all supply of inland stations was accomplished in this manner. Flying a precision mission is one thing. But getting your plane off the ground is another. These are Jato bottles, often necessary as a shot in the arm during takeoffs from the snow surface. Four of these, firing at once, equal an extra engine wide open. One drawback, however, cutting loose with a full Jato firing cycle is almost like using your tail assembly for a rocket launching pad. Taking off is the R-4D, one of the original Antarctic workhorses of the air. Easily adapted to the use of skis, this type aircraft was the first to land at the South Pole. Although South Pole landings are now commonplace, it wasn't long ago that this operation presented a highly hazardous challenge to the Antarctic airmen. Nothing is routine in sub-zero temperature, not even normal maintenance. This engine decided to call it quits at the South Pole, 800 miles from the nearest air facility. But all the crew asks for is a new engine with something to lift it up. Even if the work isn't routine, the can-do spirit certainly is. Tying in closely with the conquest of the air is the taming of the land itself. This is a section of the snow miller, a Swiss-built milling machine being flown into the construction site of the new bird station. These are the giant claws of the 20-ton mechanical mold, a strange-looking craft with an insatiable appetite for hard-packed snow. Spewing its dinner two stories high, the snow miller carves a four by eight foot trench, paving the way for an entirely new type of Antarctic construction. After the snow miller completes its rough cut, the sides of the trench receive a final surfacing. The new bird station, typical of the trend toward permanency, sees its first prefabricated arch swung into place. As fast as the assemblies are installed, New material is flown in on a fast-paced schedule by the versatile C-130s. 